Um, I also love gemstones, crystals, and whatnot. You need a tourmaline. What's a tourmaline? Uh, what it does is it looks like a piece of coal, but when you put it in your pocket, all the negative energy that goes to you, the stone pushes back against them. But I'm doing that naturally. Well, that'll help, Barry. That'll help. And that'll help. What's, it, what's it called? A tom a what? Tourmaline. I might be a human tourmaline. You are, but you got your perspective. I just want to be happy. Don't you want to be happy? Thank you, thank you, thank you, guys. Uh, really excited to be here. So, a lot of things to talk about, and I'm um, looking forward to the Q and A. So, really, the context of what I want to talk about tonight is entrepreneurship through the lens of parents and children. Obviously, you know, as I get to sit up here and look around the crowd, it's it's a lot of fun to see the mix of the audience going so high and low um, in age group, and, and it really speaks to a lot of things that are extremely near and dear to my heart. You know, what, what's really interesting about the day and age that we live in right now is entrepreneurship is cool, entrepreneurship is a viable option, it's a path that a lot of people are choosing, aspire to choose, um, and that is wildly different than what it was when I was the age of a lot of the youngsters in this room. Being 43 and growing up in the 80s and 90s for my you know, school years, kid years, there really was only one option, which was go to the best college you can, and that is the leverage point to the job. And I'm sure for a lot of people here, call it 38 and older, that makes a lot of sense. That was our framework. What's interesting about that framework was so much of my happiness and so much of what I talk about is predicated on the circumstances of my upbringing which were quite humble being you know, a, a Russian immigrant and going to Queens and Jersey and really like grinding out that lifestyle. And number two, just remarkable parenting. You know, I am completely the byproduct of really, really great parenting which mo more than anything else allowed me to not be suffocated by the fact that I was an atrocious student and allowed me to lean into that I had hustle. You know, it's crazy to me to think back um, and think about all the teachers and all my friends' parents who told me I was gonna be a loser or I was not gonna be successful even though I was making $800 a weekend as a 12-year-old slinging baseball cards. And, and and I guess in a lot of ways, there's a lot of things I wanna to touch on tonight, including the reverse of everything I'm saying. I think one of my great fears currently is that entrepreneurship is cool, and it is a viable option, and I believe that 90% of the people that sit in here and think they're gonna be an entrepreneur are not gonna be successful at it because it's ridiculously hard. And not that I wanna say that to crush a dream, I wanna say it to give people permission to fail and then to adjust once they get older or, or even for the parents in here who decide to start an entrepreneurial career and uh, instead of a job and when it fails, you know, I really am scared that entrepreneurship takes the place of a Harvard degree that I grew up with. There is no exact right way of anything. This is, you know, if there's anything I wanna get across tonight, it's self-awareness. You need to figure out who you are, not try to be like somebody else and then more importantly, and in parallel, because I'm gonna jump back and forth of things that seem like contradictions, I, I think one of the things that we have to really talk about in the business world, and definitely in the parenting world, is actually meaning it when we say that happiness needs to be the North Star. Um, something, I'm, I'm, I'm outrageously sensitive to the current state of the human race and definitely the context I understand which is a lot of different cultures but definitely the American culture, there is way too much unhappiness in our society and it, it's predicated on a lot of different variables but the biggest one is, or not the biggest one, but some of the things that dramatically stand out is overvaluing other people's opinions, uh, being delusional, the amount of ambition coming out of people's mouth that does not match the work ethic that they're putting in 
is the funniest thing for me in society. The amount of people who, I don't think people understand what they're saying. It's very hard to be a millionaire. The top 1% earners in America, top 1% starts at $430,000 a year. If you make $430,000 a year in America, you are in the 1% earners in our country, yet people throw around millionaire, like that's just the beginning because I'm gonna be a billionaire. <laughs> and so, you know, to not, you know, what I want, you know, this is fun for me, taking advantage of the context of this room, given kind of this beautiful setting and this amount of people in it, you know, I'm a, I tend to like this kind of environment much more than some of my bigger speeches and more than let's say five people. This is a very sweet spot for me. Um, and so I'm excited about tonight. I really, how are we doing Q and A? Are we gonna be running mics or are we gonna be setting up mics? Do, do we know from the back? Because I might even go to it a little bit earlier because I have a funny feeling a lot of you know where I'm gonna go with a lot of this stuff and I wanna milk as much interaction as possible and even seeing how you guys are collectively reacting, I will definitely be doing that. Um, are you gonna run mics? You've got the questions from the audience. Yes. Can I break the system a little bit and play? Yeah. Great, all right, so I'll be, <laughs> I'll be taking questions. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna play here a little bit. I'm gonna talk about a couple more things, but we're gonna go into, you know, when you ask your question, I'm gonna ask you to go loud, I, and I'll repeat it so everybody hears it, but look, I mean, I think this is a very special time in, in the world, and I think, on, you know, it's really funny. I always talk about don't be in the middle, don't be half pregnant. I pull from opposite directions. I have, you know, a lot of what is interesting about me is I see very, very different people associated with my message. People that genuinely don't agree on a single thing politically or socially because they're hearing different things from me and I, I bounce around and, I, and I'm been thinking a lot about it. You know, parenting philosophy, entrepreneurship philosophy, obviously political philosophy, like we are pulling further and further apart from each other. People are pulling in such opposite directions, yet I, I, I feel like there's so many merits and so many different nuanced points of view and I just think that we've become so one dimensional and so absolute. Uh, I think we have to start talking more about allowing people to change their mind. I think if we make changing your mind something that is put on a pedestal instead of demonized, you know, I think that would really help us. You know, I, I talked about recently, I think I tweeted and I looked at it very carefully of how it was interacted with, that changing your mind is the ultimate strength. My, you know, it's funny, it was with my dad the other day. I used to, I would change my mind all the time. I, I change my mind all the time now. And it used to drive my dad crazy. My dad's super old school and he kind of thinks like if you said something, you know, then that's it for life. You know, and, and I just remember that quite a bit growing up building the business, the wine store uh, that my dad had and I helped build to a big level and you know, he's like three weeks ago you said that we had to put liquor in the front and I'm like, I changed my mind. I listened more to the customer, I tried the liquor in the front, I don't like what it did, we're changing. And I think a lot about that now with my content which is why am I so comfortable with trying things. I posted a video yesterday that was upside down on Instagram. I don't know how many of you saw it. And, 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 maybe, and then a couple days earlier, I made a video where I just said like this post like 58 times in a row. And I've been using this hashtag in the two posts that you know always be testing. And it's really my way to give you a nod of giving you permission. The like, like, like video did okay. The upside down video yesterday did not do well and that excites me and I'm excited to spend more time over the next you know, year or two of trying things completely left field to hopefully inspire people to, you know, what I'm so unbelievably concerned about for everybody in here who's creating content, whether on YouTube or Instagram or other places, is you've become so obsessed with the number associated with the post that you're not actually even putting out anymore what you want to put out, you're putting out what you know is gonna work. And that leads to real insecurity. There are people still showing way too much skin because they know that does better. There's people that are flexing when they can't afford to because they know that does better. There's people regurgitating other people's quotes because they know that does better. I mean, it's just, it's not, it's not working and it's, and it's going to continue to decline in value and I'm sure if you know anything about me, my number one thesis is 
producing content at scale right now. It is such an opportunity. I, I couldn't, you know, I'm gonna beat this horse until not only is it dead, but it's buried and a, I throw a bomb on it. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is the, for everybody in here who's nowhere close or not at where they want to be, it is absolutely the most cost effective way to start the process to whatever you want. It is about producing content producing content at scale for as many platforms as possible. So many people in this room could have all the things that they wanted to happen on YouTube and on Instagram for the last three and a half years and has not happened, actually happen if they get serious about TikTok for the next six months. You know, I'm, I'm already seeing it. I'm already, how many people here have posted their first post on TikTok in the last two months? Raise your hands. How many of you of the hands that just put up actually got a lot of views on a post that you would never expect it. It's a high percentage. And this is what happened on Twitter and YouTube and Facebook and Instagram in the early days. And obviously TikTok's not early days because it's musically, then reformatted TikTok, but the scale of users on it and the attention it has is not still filled with enough content. For all the content that's out there, there's still more attention than there is content, which is why on day one, anybody here get real views on their first actual post by any chance? You did? Like some of the people are getting this and they're like email, you know, obviously I've been on a, you know, this is what I do. If you followed my career or if you wanna know, like every one, three, five years, I get hot. I've been analyzing for six months, a month, five months, I feel firm and I'm ready to cheerlead a new platform because I think it's crossed the chasm of my filter to saying, okay, this actually is a good use of your time, period. And so this is what happens in my career. But I've never seen a platform, given how it got big and then got bought and then got big, I've never seen a platform reward creators with so much free attention on their first post ever. And so, Back to a lot of like the micro things, if you leave with anything, like whether you're nine or 99, I think TikTok needs to be taken serious because it has the potential to be completely mainstream for every age four years from now. It may not. It may go the route of social cam or Vine, but if it goes the route of Facebook and Instagram, you're gonna get so much more dividends. And the other thing, everyone's always like, Gary, I don't wanna waste my time. Or like, I don't have enough time the upside is so much greater than the time, especially if you have a lot of ambition. Again, this is what continues to baffle me. Gary, I wanna build something, you know, I wanna leave my job that I don't like, and I, I wanna start this side hustle around Star Trek or, or soccer or cooking, but I don't have time to post on TikTok too. I just will never be able to figure that out unless you're working and you're with your family 20 hours a day, 18 hours a day, you do have time. You're just not willing to sacrifice the time or the energy that's needed to actually have a life that is based on your own terms. We are, something, a word I have not used historically that I'm starting to use is sacrifice. I'm fascinated by people's inability to sacrifice luxuries Gary, I don't have money, but I buy $7 Starbucks. You don't need a $7 coffee, right? You don't need a $12 scrunchie. Like, you don't need an $80 hoodie. You don't need it. You're more than welcome to have it, but please don't come to me and cry that you don't have money for Facebook ads when you buy dumb shit. And so I think about that. I think about it a lot. And so these are the themes I'm thinking about. I think it's never, ever, ever, ever been a better time to build a business or to build something for yourself than right this second. It has never existed. This is the, right now, as we're in here, this is the single best time ever because the internet continues to grow in its scale, which means nobody's actually stopping you. The internet's the offset to bad behavior by humans. It is, there's no gatekeeper. There's nobody who's making a prejudice decision, a sexist decision, nobody's stopping you from signing an account on TikTok or LinkedIn or Facebook or YouTube and making. Nobody. It really is the great equalizer. 
I was having a conversation with somebody over the weekend at the football game and they're like, man, it's crazy how many of these female rappers are popping. Meg Thee Stallion, Cardi, you know, like everyone, like a lot of them are winning. Sweetie, I'm like, it's not confusing. The industry only allowed one woman to be on top 15 years ago when they had control. Now the internet has control. There's no confusion. This was always the way it should have been. And so, but, but, and I think we can all agree, but politically there's this understanding of suppression and things of that nature. People are confused. The internet isn't playing within the ecosystem that we live. They're not. And so to me that's inspirational. That's amazing. It's crazy to me that we all have these at bats. By the way, you may be confused, that's my story. The way I present myself, the way I roll, the education I had, the way I curse, the, the ideas I have, the establishment never believed in them. No internet, no me. Wall Street Journal wasn't gonna be writing about me. And so I think that if you leave with anything tonight, that the second you actually truly start realizing that if you don't have the success you want, that that's you. The second you actually genuinely stop blaming anything, and the second you start taking on 100 accountability, is the second you start getting happy. For real. What I'm really excited about, especially with such a young crowd, is thinking about the young entrepreneurs in here who I want to talk to. To me, the fact that you're even here, whether you wanted to be here or your parent dragged you out, you know, <laughs> is something I think a lot about. You know, I think, you know, I'm so grateful for entrepreneurship. You know, one of the things that, one of the things about starting a YouTube channel and not having a lot of views or trying to sell some slime and only send, selling zero, you know, on your Shopify. One of the things that the kids in this room don't understand yet is that no and losing are their best friends. 100%. I, unfortunately, and this is just the truth, kids in this room, you're growing up in a time where grown-ups wanna stop you from feeling losses and pain more than ever because truthfully, our, we've now lived through 70 years of prosperity and our parents can actually spend time worrying about that stuff instead of putting food on the table. But not to get too heady here, if, for the kids in this room, the number one thing about starting a business or trying to build a profile is that you're gonna lose a lot. A lot of people are gonna leave comments that you stink, that you should stop, and you're not good. You're gonna try to sell something and nobody's gonna buy it. I think back to one story I never tell that I just got inspired to tell in this room, just remembered, was I actually sold stuff door to door a lot more as a kid than I remembered. I just thought about it the other day. I used to just find things in my house that might have not even been mine. <laughs> and I used to just walk around Edison, New Jersey, <laughs> ringing people's doorbells and asking them if they wanted to buy it. I was <laughs> do you want to buy this weird t-shirt or this <laughs> pencil? <laughs> like, and when, you, when you're selling ridiculous stuff that nobody wants, outside of the one person every 50 homes that just thought you were a cute kid and gave you a dollar, you just got a lot of no's. And, and one of the reasons I think so many people are struggling and are unhappy in their early 20s is we're coming into a place where people are hitting their 20s that were parented of a generation that tried to overprotect. And, and I think losing is awesome because you deserved it. I Means somebody was better than you. And that's good for you to know because that's real life. That's how it's gonna be. And I think getting somebody to say no is awesome because that's real life. It doesn't mean you suck. It means what you tried to do right now didn't work. And I think that we have to have a much bigger conversation around that and I'm happy a lot of you are listening to it right now because it's very real. Because I will tell you, kids, and parents for that matter, that I sit up here tonight extremely happy because I was losing so much and got so many no's as a kid. Because now that I'm a grown up, it doesn't scare me. And unfortunately for a lot of grown-ups, it continues to scare them. They cared about what kids in high school thought about their dress. They cared about opinions and they were overprotected and it made them incapable. I really believe in the zoo animal thing 
We go to the Central Park, Bronx Zoo right now and release those animals into their natural habitat, they're dead in 10 seconds. And I think we have to be very thoughtful for the parents in this room, especially who brought their kids tonight, you have to let them lose. No fake, in, fake environments are destroying their actual confidence. It's true. It's the great disservice of parenting to eliminate merit and the truth from your kids. So I, I really like entrepreneurship for that. You know, my mom didn't micromanage, she let me live, which means the, the system said no to me a lot. I did a lot of card shows that I didn't do well on. I had a lot of bad things happen. You know, when I was 13, 40 year old dudes were ripping me off, you know, cause they just imposed their old man will on me and scared me, like all sorts of stuff happened. All of which allow me the great luxury to be in front of you tonight. So really ultimately here's what I would say and then I'll go into Q&A because I think we'll bring the most value. I desperately need you guys to leave here understanding how ridiculously lucky we are to be alive during this era. This internet thing is no joke. No joke. And, and I just, and, and by the way, for everybody who gets a trillion followers and makes it and, let, I mean, Justin Bieber, YouTube, like it's now been a while since this has been happening and working. I think for a lot of this room, you may not go on to be Bieber or build a YouTube channel that makes $80 million selling toys, but the real conversation that isn't being talked about is I do believe almost everybody in this room is uncomfortably capable of producing a $100,000 a year business if they put in a lot of time and a lot of effort and have skill, whether that is through making a channel and having brands subsidize that or selling stuff or starting a product. And, and I hope that everybody who watches this that's not in here or even the people in here realize that that's a big statement. That's a lot of money. It just is. And, and I say it so simply, but it's not simple at all. But the fact that you can in a way that you never could before is remarkable. And I think all the people you look up to or you admire or you've watched build real businesses or real influence on these platforms, they're the preview, not the anomaly. And not everybody's gonna have my natural talent or work ethic or the chips fall the way they did. But I don't, I want people to love their game the way I love it, not get the accolades or success that I have. Because the happiness is way more fun than the byproduct. And I know a ton of people who are unbelievably happy and make 49,000 a year and I know an enormous amount of people who are deeply unhappy and sick who make seven million dollars a year and something I've been saying a lot and I wanna say more often, there was always that joke that people talked about like around always valuing money and they talked about I'd rather cry in my Ferrari, right? And I, that, that saying always pissed me off, right? This notion that, okay, you're crying, you're deeply unhappy, and the Ferrari versus a Toyota is supposed to be some sort of variable there. It's, it's such insane bad talk. Everybody should aspire to be smiling in their Toyota. If you find out and understand yourself and you put yourself in the best position, and you happen to have talent, and you put in a ridiculous amount of work, then you might be able to smile in your Ferrari. And that's amazing too. But these are the things that are running through my head, and I appreciate you having here tonight. Thank you. So let's do some Q&A. Who's got a question? Yes ma'am, stand up and ask away. Oh, you have a mic, nice. Gonna try to play a little bit? Right. Yeah, we'll do the best we can. Are we gonna get this one on? Yeah. Try your best, we'll, we'll bounce around. Who's got a question? This, this young lady right over there, stand up. Hey, well, lucky number one I love here. you too. What's your name? 
Uh, my name is Rafka, and first I just wanted to say thank you so much for like everything you give to us through all your content that you provide and to like the whole community that you built. Thank you. Um, my question is, okay, so just a little background about me is that I have a jewelry business and I design and I sell on a website. Awesome. Um, and I'm 23. Awesome. So I wanted to know how you separate like your personal life, your business life, and your social life and everything that comes outside the business yep. and then separate it when it comes to once you're in the office or, or even a step further, like when one thing happens to your business, how do you like get out of that mindset and move to the, on to the next thing without being distracted and staying focused? Trying. You know, some days something happens in the office and even though I'm going to like a family holiday dinner, I just can't get over it because I haven't figured out the solution yet. For me, I've got a lot of experience and I also, to be frank, am wildly not that concerned about money slash my business, I'm really not. I just don't know what else to say and that's not because I've done well. I was that way when I was grinding and building. Like, it's just, I just don't put business, it's my greatest passion and it means nothing to me. I'm being dead serious. Because I know that if I built a billion dollar, trillion dollar thing, bought the jets, and my family dies in a plane accident, I'm not a happy person. So perspective really helps me. It's if everyone's alive, I'm good. I struggle with taking people's judgment, both cheers and boos, so that's good. So I'm just kind of cruising. But the biggest, but the answer I'm giving to you that I think will help you is not necessarily where I'm at at 43 years old, with. 37 years of practice in my mind, it's where you're at. And to me the answer is don't overjudge yourself if you can't. It's only one day. If you have something going on in a personal relationship that screwed up your day at work because you couldn't get going, that's okay. That's not only okay if you screw up a day, it's okay if you waste a week, it's also okay if you waste a month. My biggest thing is why are we overjudging ourselves? We're just all living out here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I mean, you know? <laughs> it's... I mean, it's so much more like easier to say like, oh, it's just perspective, but like on the daily when things are happening and I don't know, you're in the middle of doing something, let's say for your business. Who's, who do you love the most in the world? My family. Good, who in your family? Pick one. <laughs> um, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> You're very politically correct. Cool. Every day, make in the in like literally once a day, genuinely sit there for five minutes and make pretend one of them got shot in the face. I'm being dead serious with you. Every single day, I almost I said this today earlier. I probably once a week to four times a week sit there truly in the shower on a flight when I wake up. Some people meditate, right? Some people work out, right? To deal with whatever anxieties or thoughts they have. I actually sit and truly try to convince myself that I have lost one of the five most important people in my life and that is the biggest thing I do that leads to the biggest happiness I have. Like, what? You didn't sell enough earrings today? <laughs> like seriously though, people lack perspective. It, it's actually remarkably easy if it, became, if it becomes the way you see the world. Like what? What? Like we have completely lost perspective as a society. Do you know how many people on earth have it way worse than you? Billions. I, know, but you I just want to remind everybody, we're sitting in Manhattan right now. <laughs> we have completely lost perspective. So it is easy for me because I've practiced that perspective because I grew up hearing the stories of my mom losing her mom at five, my dad losing her, his dad at 15, them being in the Soviet Union. I remember sitting in a studio apartment with eight family members and having nothing. Like, I don't know, it's very easy. 
You're 23. You're winning. I know. I have your quote on my phone that says you could go hard for 10 years and, and do everything wrong and get up and still. It, it doesn't mean that you're not trying to do the best you can and what have you, but you have to quantify that emotion. You know? My biggest thing to you is you have to make sure that you eliminate judgment. Where everyone's losing is they're worried about what other people think. Everybody, everyone's losing that game. Because the reason I can deal with losses every minute is I don't care what you're saying about my loss. I love this when athletes get to this level. The reason they're doing well is they don't care what ESPN said or what you said on Twitter. They're playing, you're in the seats. And that's how I think about everybody. I'm playing. What, you're gonna say I had a bad idea or it didn't work? I'm playing. And so I think that may help you too. Like at this day and age, nothing is private. It's like everyone knows everyone's business. That's so not it's true. Like, I'm minding my own business. That's not true. You guys know no nothing about. Is. You know nothing about my family. What 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 people put on social media? That you pay the consequences. Everyone thinks they know about you, even though they don't. That means you're worried about their opinions. No, I mean I personally. Good. Like, don't, but. So then go back to your question, so I can help you because I'm enjoying this. What? You know, what, what's, you know, what's easier said than done for you? No, because I feel like What I, bothers you? I feel like I constantly am getting distracted. By? By just being 23 and that, uh, and that life outside of business. Makes sense. There's, there's just so, there's so much ahead, but like you feel... Like you're like missing out? No, 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 not, no, not at all. But like you feel that... Like there's a lot of time, but there's not. Like you have, you're in your 20s, you have all these good years, and it's very like I'm 20. Let me tell you about your 40s. They're fucking good. <laughs> I get it, I get it, and you'll appreciate this, and I'm glad we did this. That's why I talk about patience. Yes. <laughs> you know, because you, what you're actually saying is you're impatient, and that's okay. No, no, I'm not. Okay. Um, you are. <laughs> But that's okay, go ahead. No, I'm patient, but now it's gonna sound like I care what people think, but I feel like everyone is like always in my business, like, oh, when are you doing this, and when are you doing that? Why are you listening? And then it makes me unpatient, even though I'm patient. No, no, it makes you impatient because you're valuing other people's opinions. You just literally made both of my points. (laughs) (laughs) Literally. No, but it's like- You said, I don't care what anybody thinks, and I'm patient, and then your answer to it was, people are in my business saying shit, which makes me impatient. (laughs) <laughs> Let's move on. This feels like a daily V coming to life. Uh, so first off, I want to say it's a small world. I grew up in Flemington, or well, Somerville before that, so. Love it. Yeah. Somerville, wow, you grew up in Somerville and Flemington, and for all you hardcore New Jersey uh, connoisseurs, both of them have a circle, which is very rare in Jersey. That's annoying, but anyways. <laughs> um, so my dad's actually been following your content before I even knew about you, and he knew you before you, when you were the wine guy, and you know, so I'll be, I'm, I'm gonna embarrass him, but he's like, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about for business, <laughs> but anyways, now we're starting a farm, and there's a lot of vineyards that are popping up in Hunterdon County, and yeah, it's actually heard. kind of struggling. Uh, the Union Hotel, it's in like really bad disrepair. I, yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to see what I can do for the town, and I've stayed loyal. I actually got kicked out of high school for something I'm not gonna talk about here. <laughs> but um, I basically like, stuck up to the like, superintendent. I'm like, go ahead, kick me out. I'll go to North Hunterdon and I'll mm-hmm. still get my diploma. Mm-hmm. And you're gonna have a bad name when I make something of myself. And you know, I've auditioned for Shark Tank. I've met like, so many people. Like David Meltzer came out to one of our events. I do a event coordination at Microsoft at the Times Square. And even before I started all of that, I came to your lobby and I like, took a picture on Instagram, I'm like, all right guys, I need this to blow up, so I was trying to meet you. And you're like, I'm sorry, I'm busy with family, but is this an emergency? I'm like, uh, not really. But <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for telling the truth. Yeah, so, like, even meeting David, like, it was just kind of crazy, I'm like, because he was talking, and I, my mind instantly went to you before he even mentioned you, and I'm, when I went to meet him after, I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm gonna talk about Gary this whole time, but that's just, like, been such a huge inspiration for me, it's like. Thank you. I'm just saying my story more so because like, I'm living proof that I actually was able to get somewhere. You know, starting out with a clothing line, watching Taylor's video of like 20-something year olds, trying that, and you're like, 
what are you doing different? So that made me think even more. <laughs> You know? what's, what's really great about you saying making something is just how early you are in it. Mm. You know, people, a lot of my friends or people, they get frustrated with me when I talk about buying the Jets and they're like, when they, when I, when they ask me when and I say things like 25 years, they're like so disappointed. And for me, it's like so remarkable. Mm -hmm. Like coming here with nothing and not even being able to own a jersey. To like, if I buy the Jets at 68 years old, that's an all-time accomplishment. People are so impatient, you know, to your point. Like it's real. Like to me, I'm so excited because you feel accomplished and yet you literally are about to live four more full lives. Just the sheer amount of damage that can be done. Like back, back, because I want to put this record in your mind, like you're literally very likely, I know you could get hit by lightning, but it's very likely that you're gonna live four more full lives of what you've already lived. And when you start putting it in that perspective, you know, that's why I say things like that because it helps people slow down. One of the places I'm spending a lot of time right now is on people that are 60, because if you're 60, you grew up in an era where 60 was like where people died when you were 18 and 12 and things of that nature, yet it's likely you have 30 more years. So you're acting like you're wrapping it up and you still have like a real chunk. <laughs> you do. It's very real and so I think humans really struggle quantifying time. And it's funny, I just said something, I used to do this all the time. I was so, amb you know it's funny, I associate with lack of patience because my ambition was so high. So I can respect where that comes from from a lot of people. And I used to do something, when I first got into my dad's business, I was like three years in I was already crushing and I'm like oh, I've only been doing this for three years, and in three years, I'll only be 28. <laughs> you know, I'd get excited, and then I'd have like, you know, you know, seven years into it at 29, I was like, man, and I, at that point, I really already made it at some level for the family, and I was like, oh, in seven years, I'm only gonna be 36. And even to this day, like it blows my mind that I'm sitting up here and I've only been in my career, all my careers, for 21 years. You know, <laughs> and for me to say, from this moment in 21 years, right, I'll be 64 and that's young. There's a lot you can do and, and now I'm starting it here. At 22 I was starting with a liquor, you know what I mean? So I, it's, I'm glad you feel that way, which triple excites me because you haven't started. Yeah, uh, I know. Like I, I make websites and I get like 90% there and then for whatever reason, you, you know, that bored. other 10% like just never clicks, so. Because you got bored. Yeah. It's the same reason you and I sucked at school. Or yeah. hated school, or whatever you I, did. I was. I'm sorry, I believe you. I'm not what, 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 like a you, you, A student, but I didn't whether care. you were whatever it was, you were breaking the system. Yeah, and that comes out of boredom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, like I wanted to be like a singer at a young age, and my mom, like kind of like her, she, she sat me down. And she's like, "That's not realistic. Focus on what you could actually accomplish." You know, so I, I was an immigrant too. Moved here when I was two years old. So it's it. just thanks like, for coming. Too much. It's, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Gary. Hello. My name is Ross, and I've waited a long time to say hi to you. Thank you, um, Ross. I watched you for the last eight to ten years, and I now am co a founder of an education company here in New York City and around the country. And my one question to you um, is, and that's not that I'm having problems getting sales, like schools all over, right here in New York City, all the boroughs, they have our program, it's called the Web Guys program. Okay. And we teach kids entrepreneurship and we give them tools to create their own companies online, completely okay. free of charge in the public school system. Understood. My question to you though, and it's been racking my brain, what, how would I use social media to target teachers and principals and staff of schools, not necessarily that I don't want to target kids. I got and, it. You know? By, but, by yeah. creating content for them on LinkedIn and then running ads against people that hold those jobs. That's a good idea. Thank you. <laughs> um, and also, <laughs> how, how would you frame, and this is a problem I don't struggle with like all the time, but I teach kids every single day and I have a staff of 15 to 18 people that also I hire as teachers. How would you frame entrepreneurship to 13 to 15 year olds in a classroom setting? What would be the best, what do you think? You know, I, I think it's, it's interesting. The, the, the things that are running through my mind is number one, making them realize that entrepreneurship is more like sports. 
So that would be something I would tell kids. I'm like, hey kids, we're gonna talk about this, but I want you to know this is like sports, meaning I could sit here for the next hour and teach you how to play basketball. I can show you what a jump shot looks like, the rules, you know, what some of the best players did about it, but then we're gonna go to the court and some people are just not gonna be good at it. Like, and entrepreneurship only plays out in real life, not in a classroom. So I wanna, A, that would be the first place I would start because there's nothing about the rest of school that maps to the reality of entrepreneurship, right? Yeah. So that would be one. The other things I would talk about, you know, probably I would start talking about the loneliness of it now because I think that's something that we don't and didn't talk about a long time that a lot of people are struggling with. What really sucks about being an entrepreneur is when you lose, you can't blame someone else. It's really fun to work at a company because when you stink, you blame the boss. When your company fails, it's your fault. And uh, so accountability, I would talk a lot about accountability and not being able to hide and, you know, I would talk about a, a lot of mindset stuff. And then I would put them in the field and let them sell lemonade. Well, we have them create like little apps and companies within the classroom, so then they have to market it to the rest of the school. Yeah, I mean, I love that, but I think, I think as you know, that's a little contained environment right. and it's a nice, it's great. But I would, I, would, I would interject some of the bigger truths for the ones that go on to actually do it. Awesome, and is it a possibility I can take a photo with you at some Yeah, we'll point? do it at the end, awesome. for sure. Thanks. Let's keep it going. Don't worry, we got time. I see the, I see the emphatic hands, we'll get to you. I see you guys over there. So first off, um, I'm on the moon right now because I'm talking to you and I'm literally like 10 feet away from you. Yes, I see um, you. So this is insane. Um, so I'm actually, uh, I don't know if you remember, but I was the kid that um, you kind of, you know, roasted on Twitter. I remember. Um, and, uh, so yeah, so I'm, I'm the Nick Anderson uh, kid that was like, hey, uh, can I intern for you this summer? And uh, you're like, yeah, what, what, what did I say? I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> what, what, what? You're like, when? And I was like, oh, the summer. Oh, what's, uh, and then you said like, oh, what's D-Rock, uh, you had. I said, hit up D-Rock. Yeah, and then I was like, what's his email? And that's when I got excited. And that's when he said, uh, when you want to intern for me and can't figure this out, frowny face. Yep. So, um, and that was probably one of the most important reality checks of my life. Um, Nick, you know what's super interesting about this story? This is so amazing to me because and I, I, I'm gonna play here with you a little bit because this is really good because I, I really admire you because we continued the conversation later and then you emailed me, which is in my inbox. I, I, this is super fun for me too because I'm so behind on email, but I'm flying to Miami tomorrow. I'm like, you know what, I need to catch up on email and literally when I thought that today, I was like, okay, my book publisher's in there. This is literally what went through my mind a couple hours ago. You're gonna, this is so fun to meet you in person. I was like, okay, my book publisher reached out to me in my inbox. They wanna give me a new big deal. I should probably find out what they're offering. Um, and I was like, oh crap, that Nick Anderson kid is in my inbox because I told him to email me after we talked on, on text. Nick, there's an even more interesting part of this story. So I tweeted that out, as you know. <laughs> um, yeah. And I remember, because your name was Nick Anderson, I was like, you know what? I'm not gonna black out the name. Sometimes I black out the name, but I'm like, that's such a generic name, like Nick Anderson, the three-point shooter for the Magic, and a bunch right. of other, there's a lot of Nick Andersons, yeah. so I'm like, I'm gonna put that out. It actually got picked up in the advertising uh, rags. Ad Age. Correct. Yep, yeah, I and, didn't know about that until the call with Andy. And Ad Age took a really negative approach at the way I handled that, and were basically trying to tell me that I'm a bad person for doing that. And I understand. And now you are actually the human involved in it and you thanked me behind the scenes and now you're standing here and saying it's one of the best things that's ever happened to you. Right, because the ingenuity, you, you talked about the ingenuity of being able to find an email address. It's also a complete and actual real life example of what I'm talking about in the first 10 minutes of this talk, which is Ad Age decided to take a snarky point of view on me and try to paint me as a bad guy when what I was actually trying to do is bring you value. We live in a world right now where everybody wants everything over coddled and then it leads to kids being depressed because they're incapable. Uh, you took it the way 90% of people took it, which is you're happy it happened and I'm completely convinced that it's the kind of thing that's gonna change the way you do things going forward in a positive way. 
I meant what I said. I wasn't saying, there was no tone of like, you're a loser and you're an idiot. There was, you know, my team's hardcore, we go hard, and if like you can't find DRock's email, you're, this is probably something you want to like understand as a prerequisite. I, I do want to put it into context. Like I was at again, I was on the moon when you replied to me. So <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh my god, oh my god, like oh my god, I what's totally the email? Get like, that. Oh, I was like, oh my. And the good news is, like, yeah. trust me, I'm not so overly worried about. Yeah. Like I, that makes sense to me. If Randy yeah. the Macho Man Savage texted me it, it's in 1987, the same thing. I would have lost my mind. Right. So. I think, I think uh, nonetheless, I, I just wanted to give the room context because it's right. crazy that this is happening when it's the living proof of what the first 15 minutes of this talk was about. So keep going. Right, so, um, so I, I just wanted to kind of touch on um, a little bit before, so I wanted to do a little bit of a plug. Um, so well, I, at my college, I go to Nichols College um, and I, as a freshman, um, well before that, I was impacted by cancer in my life. Um, I had uh, several people in my family, and uh, my best friend's father passed away our freshman year of high school. So um, I went to Nichols College, and I, I, um, I actually joined one of his Relay for Life teams. It's by the American Cancer Society. And uh, I came to Nichols, and I realized there wasn't an event there. So I decided, hey, you know what? I'm just going to start this from the ground up. Um, I went door to door. I got two, over 200 signatures. Um, I actually, so we did this thing too. You're going to fucking love this one. So um, we did this thing called. Uh, Suck for a buck, uh, and 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 don't mind the name. Be no, careful. No, no. There's a lot marketing. of kids in here. Marketing, <laughs> marketing. We would vacuum people's rooms for a dollar. Love it. So I would go and say, yep. and I want to get a GoPro or something on my chest yep. for one of these days that I do it. I say, hi, uh, would you like to participate in Suck for a Buck? Mm -hmm. And oh my God, the, yeah, the people it, it is just awesome. So what we would do. Um, is my roommate here, Brian, um, Brian McLaughlin, by the way, uh, wink, it. wink. I hacked Brian's Instagram so many times. Just so everybody knows what's happening here, <laughs> yeah. Brian McLaughlin is, McLaughlin. McLaughlin is also an agent at Vayner Sports, the same name, just not this one. Yeah, you unfortunately, know. maybe one day. That's awesome. <laughs> right, so, um, so long story short, um, we set our goal for 10,000. And we, uh, we actually had some people that, in administration that said, hey, you know what? You should lower the goal to 7,500. Yep. And uh, we pretty much said, nope, not doing that. Uh, hit 10,000 10, two weeks before the event. We raised at 15, hit that the day before the event, raised over 16,500. And to date, we've raised, raised over $40,000 for That's the awesome. American Kids. Awesome. And that was even before I met you. So now it's so, 400 million? Now it's literally <laughs> all of the money. So, so All the monies. Right, yeah. So, um, and I also, apologize because I know there's a lot of no, people who want to get to it. Yeah, no, I, I, I just want, is, I, there, is there a question? Um, it's okay if there isn't. What? Yeah, well, I, I would, if, if you would like, uh, if you have any sort of like time, because I know it's really uh, like uh, maybe after we can kind of chop it. I will definitely email you on this flight tomorrow and like we're going to offer you an internship. That was a real conversation we had. <laughs> so. <laughs> You may not take it. So. So, we'll, we'll have time this summer to talk. Thank, thank You're you. Welcome. You're thank welcome. You. Let's go to more. Yes, you stand up. I apologize, brother. Give me one second. I'm gonna bounce around. You'll be next. Go ahead. Yep, her. Yep, I'm pointing to you. Yes. Hi, Gaby. How are you? I'm Miss Self Love. I have a podcast because you told me to start a podcast on Anchor. It's about helping people heal from their breakups. Anchor.fm slash breakups is my podcast. I love it. Uh, this is my shirt. I see it. I'm on all platforms. I'm on TikTok. So I have a question about LinkedIn. Okay. So my podcast is personal. Yep. So LinkedIn is business. So how do I promote my podcast on a business site like LinkedIn? I really don't know how to. Just post it. Post it. LinkedIn is not business. LinkedIn has now become Facebook. Okay. Like, yes, LinkedIn has the component of recruiting, but the content in LinkedIn, if you watch it carefully, looks more like Facebook five years ago. There is more business content, but LinkedIn has completely crossed the chasm to be a general social network when it comes to posting on LinkedIn, and so you should just post it there. 
Thank you. Yeah, You're yeah, welcome. I listen to your podcast every day. I can't wait to take a picture with you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go. Before we go, before we go to that, dude, I want to go to this kid because he was next. Um, hi. So I have a question about starting a business. I'm trying to start um, sneaker resale. I was wondering what the best way to get into it is. Sneaker reselling business. So sneaker resell is super easy because, you know, are you looking to build a platform or are you just trying to sell sneakers? So I think platform's hard, especially in the world of Go and StockX and eBay. Like, everybody wants to build like the Uber or the StockX. Like, th you know, to me, flipping is easy. It's grinding, it's hacking, it's, it's, figuring out the website culture, it's figuring out Instagram culture, it's figuring out staying in line for four and a half hours. Um, but the to me the question is, if you're just reselling, I think you know the answers. Now it's really just about bleeding and putting it, you know, going. Um, if you're looking to build something, I think it's a very difficult time to compete on platform unless you're raising five to 10 million dollars, you know, because the cost of entry now in a StockX goat, you know, Sneaker con, there's so much. Everybody wants to be the platform where people flip sneakers. Not to mention eBay gets an uncomfortable amount. Instagram direct only. So that's my point of view on those two. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi Gary, my name is Kai. I'm from Vienna in Austria. And I just for one week in New York and I have to see you. I'm glad, I'm so thanks glad for being here. See you. And my question is, I was wondering, have you ever been so highly positive or when or what was the point in your life that you realized that positivity is the fucking game? <laughs> um, yeah, I've always been very, very positive and I do think it's a DNA trait that I share with my mom and, you know, so yes, I think that comes natural to me. I think, I think I'm starting to get to the point in my life where I'm also really fascinated about the advice I gave to the first question about why was I so scared about losing family as a kid? I've been thinking a lot lately about a re the only reoccurring nightmare I ever had in my life when I was seven to nine of this, I mean just, I had it a lot, which was we would go back to Russia on a flight and the plane would go down, right? And I'm just really thinking a lot about it. I'm thinking about what made me so scared you know, why did I love my parents so much? Like all those things and, and what did that do to my perspective and why did it put things in perspective? And you know, I, I didn't realize being happy or positive as a kid was a business advantage, but I definitely believe that without optimism, you can't be an entrepreneur, right? It's, all, it's like you have to believe, like because it's super hard. So I do think optimism and positivity are incredible ingredients but I think people have to be very careful because the other thing is I'm extremely practical and lack delusion. And being optimistic and positive leads to delusion for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. This is where self-awareness and accountability really matter. You know, just saying it isn't gonna get it done. And so, yes, positivity is the absolute game, um, but so is practicality. Understood. Thank you. Got you got it. You got it. Hi, Gary. How are you? I'm great. My name is Cindy, and I am here because my son was awarded uh, tickets by your team first in line. So I love that. Thank you. You're welcome. Ooh, yeah. Um, Two things, the, I have one question. First of all, I love acupuncture, that's what I do. I love also that. do antique auctions. I have an auctioneer's license. Love. But that's not going so great. The okay. business, that, that's just kind of slow. Um, yep. Not much with auctions. My side hustle, which I want to become my main hustle, is channeling psychic readings. Okay. And so what I'm trying to do is do Facebook Lives for free so I can give value. And uh, I actually told a couple of people here about them. And so is there anything else I could do just to kind of, I wrote a book, but. I have an idea. I think you should do it for free in real life. Okay. Somewhere, you and know, film wherever it. it doesn't get you arrested, you know. Yes. Um, and I think you should film them, 
Okay. If people allow you to, and I think that's the content you should put out. Okay, and I, I totally agree with you, so thank you. And then, and then if you think about, and a lot of you know this, and I think a lot of you have seen the Gary Vee content model deck, and if you haven't, you should look for it. Once you film it, then you post products, produce it contextual to LinkedIn. Then you take a clip and put on, t- you never know which piece of content really starts the process, um, but I, I think that would really work because then people can see it. Exactly, exactly. One more thing. Please. Um, I also love gemstones, crystals, and whatnot. You need a tourmaline. What's a tourmaline? Uh, what it does is it looks like a piece of coal, but when you put it in your pocket, all the negative energy that goes to you, the stone pushes back against them. But I'm doing that naturally. Well, that'll help, Barry. That'll help. And that'll help. What's, it, what's it called? A tom- A what? Tourmaline. I might be a human tourmaline. You are, but sometimes you need a break. Listen, I'll get one, but I'm gonna give you a real preview. I'll send you one. I will take it, and now I'm gonna give you the preview. Thank you. No, no, let me give it to you. Okay. I will 100% lose it within 48 hours. <laughs> Do you know that the biggest reason I don't wear jackets is because I lose all of them? I lose everything, except my wallet and my phone because I always am touching them because I lose everything. So, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very much. My man, my man. Right in the corner there. He knew who Nick Anderson was so I was hoping he was gonna have a question. How you doing, Gary? I'm well, brother. Yo, my name is Manny Digital. Um, I have a couple podcasts but I'm most interested, well, Fatherhood's being one of them. I'm here with the Fatherhood's Lit, Fatherhood is Lit crew. I like see 40 I know that man. Um, I saw him. So, so my question to you is, you know, just given the context of podcasts yes. and sports, because I have one that's about basketball. Okay. My conflict is being audio first yes. and not really finding a place for video just quite yet, just because it's, it's so ominous to me to have to do the audio piece, use clips to push everywhere, and then take the same toll with, with video. I know it sounds like an excuse and it's no, no, lazy, no, it's but okay. That's not how, necessarily how would you approach it in order to scale and try to get the listenership up? It's just content and guests. So just know? keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah, but I, I think a couple things. Like, you'll, you'll love this. Like, it's like, ha, ready? How do you become a better basketball player? You, you, you practice. You, you practice the reps. Right. And so, for me, the way to build awareness for one's show is practice the reps, but I wanna give you all the best moves. By not putting out video clips and images, you're not developing your left hand. Gotcha. Got it? Makes sense. Another question for you. Damn, that was good if you understand what? basketball. <laughs> if you really understand basketball, that was one of my better ones. What, what size are you, shirts? Shirt, medium. I got you. Black oh, that. Got it. I'll rock it, and I will rock it. I will support. And that's, by the way, this is the other way. You find somebody that you know will probably rock it, you know that's gonna get attention, and you get 800 more. Let me go back to guests. You should DM every single person that is in the top 1,000 of your dream guests, and three are gonna say yes, and that's gonna give you leverage. I I say it, keep more, more, right? Right? Larry Bird only made the league because he did a lot of shooting. Magic Johnson literally every morning before the bus came and literally shot a thousand shots as a kid. That's real life. It's real life. What's up, Gary? How you doing? I'm James from Fatherhood is Lit. I know, baby. I, I know you for a long time. Um, I know, man. I've been jabbing since we've been doing uh, the Fat Startup, yep. and I got my son with me over here. He's uh, he's gonna be 13, That's and he's up. been um, he's been living off of all the jabs, right? Where now he's getting all the fruits of my labor, but it's not the money; it's the perks. How Let's do go. I teach him not to pimp himself out for the free stuff and actually get some money? So, so I think he, you know, you teach him by. First of all, you still have an uncomfortable amount of time to ask, like, for the money. You know? Like, before we start worrying about him, this is really important to me. How old are you? You know, the fact that your tonality is that resigned to the fact that all the jabbing and the AKA for everybody who doesn't know what we're saying, giving you've done, 
that you, you ran out of time, you know? So I think the way you teach him is by you doing it, by showing him, you know? And I also think the biggest thing that you need to pay attention to, because I know you well, is this, I know you well, which means I like you and I know you're a good guy, but I don't know how you were jabbing, so I don't know this about you. I think one of the things that I want to make sure, especially when people start looking at my framework and they're like, you know, it's give, 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 and then ask. I'm watching a lot of people that are trying, you know, they tag me in it, and I think people are very confused by giving. I think people think they're giving, and I don't know if this is what you're doing, but I just want to go here because it's going to bring value to everybody, and it may allow you to think. A lot of, here are the reasons why people are, are good at giving and then get sad that they didn't get Here are the reasons. Number one, they literally didn't ask. Some people are actually uncomfortable with selling, which is amazing. Nothing wrong with that. Means you need to hire somebody who sells, you know? Number two, they weren't giving, they were manipulating. There are so many people that think they're giving, but they're giving with expecting. I mean, people roll up at me like, Gary, I gave, you gave me what? You didn't give me, you rolled up on me and handed me something that I had no interest in so that you could then ask me for two hours of my fucking time. You didn't give me, you manipulated me. So, you know, this is, again, because I know you're a good guy, I don't necessarily think that, but a lot of you are doing it subconsciously. You're actually not bad people at all. You're just so hungry for what you want, you don't even realize that you're not giving you're setting up your ask. That's why I work. I work because the content I'm putting out is giving. I could care less about anything that happens after. I don't need that, that's, I don't monetize my audience that way. I'm not looking for anything from you. And, and anytime I even get close to it, it's in the form of something that you may, you wear sneakers, so if you think mine look good, I'll take it over Reebok. You know, you drink wine, but I don't want you to buy it if you don't. You know, and that's why I like those kind of things versus a mastermind for 30,000 a month to teach you more, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, I think you, show, you, you teach them by showing. You know, there was a great quote that always really stuck with me, mainly because I work a lot and it, I fear the time allocation to my kids. And it spoke about, it was a quote of something like, my father showed me how to live. He didn't tell me how to live. That's what I think you need to do. Because you got so much time. What's up Gary, luck here. How you doing man? Really well. So I got my three boys here. I see them, Um, good looking crew. So me and the missus, we have two complete, we got here and two complete different separate roads. Not even close. Yep, makes she sense. has a typical um, Serena uh, story, the Tiger Woods, where her father drilled in her since she was a five years old, that you're going to be a singer-songwriter. You're going to be a singer-songwriter. Mm. Mm. 16 years old, boom, signed, major record label. <laughs> Successful singer-songwriter. Amazing. Uh, I'm the opposite. Uh, son of uh, immigrants that came here, you're not going to do it, you're not going to do it, you're not going to do it. Uh, more L's than wins, but I'm here now. And we're, they were telling you you couldn't succeed or the world was the telling world. you? Respect, keep didn't, going. Didn't have the yep. opportunity, Understood. right? Um, so now we're at a place where those L's are in our past. They're in the river mirror. And we feel like we're in a great place now, but the common denominator for us is that we both didn't go to college. Okay. So for us, we, we wanted to give them the best chance for success. So we're doing- You don't think that's college? No, well, we're doing the opposite now. We're like, you know what? It's not worth the struggle. You shouldn't have the struggles your mom did. You shouldn't have the struggles I did. So you're going to go to this school, you're going to go to that. And now we feel like where's the balance of teaching your kids this is what you have to do, giving them the best opportunity, but- You know this is the most cliche thing ever, right? Like parents always want to give their kids the things that they didn't have, but that often is exactly the thing that makes them not be able to do the things we want them to be able to do. So what are you gonna say to your kids when they say? Well, first of all, let's get real serious about this. All three of those dudes are wickedly different. They're all, not not even the same kid. You know what I mean? Like, they just are. So one of them should go to college and do that. 
one of them should. Like, the, the first thing, I, I, I don't think about kids in a master thesis, I think about one, two, three. So the number one thing I think we all need to do, especially with kids in that age group, is we need to watch. The, parenting is a game of listening, not talking. It's very cute that the two of you came up with this master thesis of what you want. What you really want is for them to be happy. Facts. Right? Facts. And so I think you need to be thoughtful about that and watch it. Now, you ask kids that age what makes them happy. It's like candy and doing nothing. You know, you, you got a guide. But I think, I think you can't put, you shouldn't put entrepreneurship on a pedestal. You shouldn't put school on a pedestal. You should put your ears on a pedestal and really watch and listen to them. The, the number one, the, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna desperately try to put my two children in a position to love their process the way I love mine. And if that comes in the form of they look at daddy's success and they wanna save the elks in Peru, you know, and go that route, then I'm, and, that, and they're passionate about that, I'm fired up. I'm not gonna pay for their shit. <laughs> I'm being serious. You're not gonna save the Elks in Peru wearing a fucking $50,000 watch. You're not gonna have a fancy New York apartment. You decided to save the fucking Elks in Peru. Your, your, your fulfillment's coming in heart, not cash. What's you gonna know? be your biggest advice if they decide to follow in your footsteps though? I apologize? What's gonna be your number one advice, like your number one like, like pro tip if they wanna say, Dad, I wanna do what you wanna do, what you do? I'm gonna say go. Mazel tov. You know, I mean, look, my kids, even from day one, are already in a better position because I plan on not giving them money, you know, but I plan on giving them an opportunity, like, and when I, when I say that, I'm not gonna be a hypocrite, my dad let me come into his business, but my dad didn't give me the business, I built my dad's business for him and left with nothing. Let's just, one more time, drill the story home for everybody who's looking for a fucking excuse. Walked in my dad's business at 22, worked every fucking day until I was 34, built it from three million to 60 million and left with nothing. Started over. Why did VaynerMedia start in Buddy Media's conference room? Because I had no money. So that's what I'll do. You wanna come and work at whatever the hell I'm doing at the time? Cool. You know, but I'm not gonna undermine all the employees in there and just put you on because your last name's Vaynerchuk. You want to be in the music business? I'll call the number one person and let them work. And then when, I hang, when I'm talking to them, I'm like, listen, don't put my kid in a fake environment. If they're good, cool. If they need to be fired, better. Better. I don't, I don't want my kids to make money. I want them to be happy. Do you know how unhappy the unbelievable amount of 34 year olds that have a senior job right now at some company because they know their mom asked for a favor, they feel like losers. So then they buy things to make them feel better that mean nothing. We need to start having the real conversation in our society. I'm actually very comfortable with it, as you can tell, and I think it's because I'm willing to deal with the reality of it instead of the ideology of it. I don't have those thoughts. I have the macro thought you guys have, which is you love them and you want them to be good. But like, what process they go through, I don't put what I went through or the counter to what I went through on a pedestal. Not Harvard, not entrepreneurship is good. Them is what's interesting to me. Who are you right now at this time? Do you know world they're gonna live in? You don't, because nor do I. Got it? It's a listening game. Cheers to that. Thanks, man. Cheers. Time.